if you're not driving in a car, to close your eyes and picture a classroom with a group of children at one end and at the other end, a big bowl of candy. And I'm gonna say, ready, set, go. And when I say go, I want you to picture in your mind what actually happens. Okay, you got the picture? Okay, here we go. Close your eyes, see the room, assume you're not driving your car. Ready, get set, go. Okay, so let me tell you what happened. Here I am in the classroom, the students at one side, the bowl of candy on the other. He said, ready, set, go. And the students all locked arms and together walked across the room and carefully divided up the candy so everybody got a fair share, an equal share. Now, my question is, how many of you saw that happen? I'm going to assume for the purpose of this that no hands went up because that's what always seems to be the case. So, um, and let me tell you why. See, what he discovered in this village was that they lived in a win-win, you and me, we're in this together culture. But nobody that I ever tell that story to ever sees that. And the reason is because we don't realize that we live in a you versus me, win-lose, I'm in it for me, culture. And that distinction between the culture that he found there and the culture that we have here makes all the difference in the world and points to the reason why you deal with every problem and every challenge you have both in your personal life and in your business. And we will talk more about that. So that is the opening line of about a one hour speech to business people that I've given dozens if not hundreds of times that has resulted in lots and lots of clients. Pretty easy, pretty easy. But we'll get back to that uh, a bit later. In the meantime, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about who I am and why I'm doing this webinar. So uh, my, my educational background is in engineering and in law. I worked for the patent office in Washington, D.C. for four years. When I graduated, I came out to Southern California and practiced as a lawyer, uh, an intellectual property lawyer for 18 years having all the training I would need to be able to do that. The only problem was 18 years into my career, I was a struggling sole practitioner. I couldn't, I couldn't keep a secretary. I mean, I had a college education, law school education, but I wish there were life coaches around at that time because I had no life skills whatsoever. I mean, really, I was hopeless and uh, clueless in Cleveland. So, um, I woke up one day and there I was, a str struggling sole practitioner, couldn't keep a secretary, didn't have a relationship with my kids. And, and I figured, I got to do something about this. So I started a, a, an investigation of what there is to learn about life that they don't teach you in school. And, um, it, it, you know, I spent the next couple of years taking a lot of education classes, doing seminars, doing workshops, and it, and it really did work. You know, uh, I... At the very end of my legal career, I was, a, I was managing a, a, an office in Orange County for a big firm in LA. I was making a six-figure income already back in the 80s. Um, but I got up at a workshop and announced my retirement and walked out into the unknown, not really having a clue what I was going to do with my life, but wanting to find something like many of you in the coaching business that really made a difference and contributed in some way. So um, I wandered around after I walked out of my loss for about 11 months, still trying to figure out what I was going to do when I heard about a meeting in San Francisco. And it sounded very interesting, so I decided to go. And uh, what I found, there was about 150 people at this meeting. Who was up in front of the room was a man by the name of Warner Earhart. I don't know how many of you know that name, but he started the S training back in the 70s and had worked with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. And uh, in the early 80s, he decided that he wanted to take the work of transformation into the business world. And so he invited all of these people who were coaches and, and to this meeting to start a franchise uh, 
where he would franchise you to use his technology and, and get into the business of coaching. So um, I jumped in. I was with that group for about five years and learned a lot from a lot of the uh, there were about 65, 66 franchisees, and we would get together several times during the year and share with each other what we were doing. And, and uh, I jumped, jumped in there, and that's where I got my start on the coaching. But I'm telling you this because what I began to notice was that the people in this organization, there was about 250 or so coaches in about 65 companies, and I quickly was able to divide those companies and people into two groups. One group I call the do-gooders. These were, and I don't mean any offense by this, but mostly uh, women-owned businesses that really wanted to help people. And they didn't really think about their companies like a business. They, 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 I labeled them do-gooders, you know? And then there was this other group, mostly men, who had been business people, uh, lawyers, business people, and they got into the coaching business, but they were used to running a business and they looked at their coaching business as a business. Now, the interesting irony is that the do-gooders, you know, did some good, you know, but mostly they struggled and they closed five-figure contracts. Whereas this other group, which I call the business people, they did a lot of good. They got to work with a lot of companies. They worked with a lot of people. They consistently closed six-figure contracts. And one of them actually closed seven-figure contracts with Fortune 50 companies. So um, I tell you this because I meet too many people who get into the coaching business who somehow think it's not holy, it's not spiritual, to want to make a lot of money. And I just, if that rings a bell for you, I would encourage you to not think that way. It's totally holy and totally spiritual to want to run a company and run it like a business and make a lot of money. And the interesting thing is the more successful you are, the greater amount of good that you're going to be able to do. So I, uh, at this original meeting, uh, I met a man by the name of Howard. I won't mention his last name but he had a coaching company up in the Bay Area. He wanted to open up an office in Southern California. He grabbed onto me and he said, um, how would you like to get into the, you know, join my company and I will coach you and train you how to be a coach and how to get business. And I said, okay. And uh, so I jumped in and I, like overnight, I became a, a coach with his company. He told me stories, he told me what they did. He gave me examples and everything like that. And then I went out and started getting, looking for clients. And it took me about, if I remember correctly, about two months to be able to stand on the shoulders of his success and authentically talk about, well, this is what we do and this is our results and this is, you know, like that. Like I had somehow participated in it, but I was just kind of standing on his shoulders and and it worked. Like I said, it took me about two months to get over my insecurities and my fears and all of that. And I remember my very first client uh, wrote me a check for $15,000 for uh, three months of coaching. And um, that really got me started my very first year as a coach. Uh, and this was now over 20 years ago. But in today's dollars, I figured that I made about $250,000 my first year as a coach, and I never looked back from there. And to be honest with you, I don't know anyone who does that doing one-on-one -on -one personal coaching. Now, for people that do one-on-one -on -one life coaching and personal coaching, God bless you. Thank you very much. But, it's, but for me, it doesn't present the opportunity to make lots of money and to work with lots of people. And so not only do I like being a business coach, because of the opportunity it makes to make money, which I don't think there's anything wrong with. I'm proud of it. But it also gives you an opportunity to really leverage yourself. So for example, uh, in the early 2000s, I got hired by a company in Michigan. It was a very nice company, nice owner, uh, had about five or six operating divisions, uh, but their sales for five straight years were between 40 and $50 million. 
And in their most profitable year, they made $300,000 on 50 million in sales. I mean, it was a joke. The president of the company was frustrated. People in the different divisions were not working together. People from one division to another was not working together. You know, they were all in their silos. It was really a mess. So uh, I got hired. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. I got hired. Uh, I took the management team away for a, a, a retreat, taught them my philosophy that I had developed. Uh, then I got an opportunity to work with every single person in the company in groups. I work with each business unit in a group. So I ultimately and effectively work with every one of the 250 people in the company. That first year that I worked with them, they went from 50 million in sales to 67 million, 67 million. The next year, 89 million. The next year, 114 million. And their profitability was well over $5 million. So this company, you know, literally doubled in size in three years, increased their profit profitability by more than 10 times. And I got to alter the culture of that company. And today they still work on that culture. So I literally had the opportunity over about a nine month period to impact the lives of 250 people. And that was just with one client. And that one client was worth about $100,000. So you don't have to have a lot of clients to make a good deal of money. And number two, every time you have a client, it's not working with one person, it's working with perhaps, you know, hundreds of people. So, so that's the reason why I'm so excited about, you know, uh, doing business coaching because you can make a multiple six figure income and, uh, you know, you can really leverage your ability to make a difference. So what's the real opportunity of working with a company? So I want to read the first sentence of uh, my latest book, Unshackle Leadership. And it says, after 30, over 30 years of working in and observing organizations of every type and size, I have noticed a theme all successful ones share. They have enthusiastic, confident, optimistic, appreciative, and happy people who work together on behalf of a future they have all committed themselves to. And do you know what? That is hardly ever the case. Uh, if you look at most companies, I like the metaphor of a boat out in the ocean. So just imagine a boat out in the ocean. You've got 50, 75, 100 people in the boat. They all have an oar, and they're all rowing casually in whatever direction they think they should go, boat should go in. You know, no real direction, no real enthusiasm. So you have that situation. You can imagine the boat's just going to go drifting along. But what if... You got all of those people in that boat, all excited, enthusiastic, and all rowing in the exact same direction. That boat is gonna move along like crazy. So um, my job has always been, when I get hired by a company, is to produce that result. To start with whatever I find and end up with an enthusiastic, confident, optimistic, appreciative, and happy people working together on behalf of the future, they have all committed themselves to. And i tell you something, you produce that result and how much you charge is irrelevant. And I learned how to produce that result and nobody ever complained about that cost. You know, and, I, and it was very expensive to work. That company, you know, that I worked with for nine months, I must, they must have paid me over $100,000 in the course of a year. But they never complained about the cost. The only one ever complained about the cost was me. I, when I got all done, I thought I probably didn't charge them enough. So uh, how do you get the business if you want to do business coaching? Well, when I started way back in the 80s, and I hadn't worked for 11 months, and, and, and I was you know, living on borrowed time and credit cards and things like that, uh, and I was desperate to get into the coaching business, you know, I would get on the phone and make cold calls. I would get business directories. I would look to see where I could get lists and names of companies in, in Orange County. And I would get on the phone and I would call companies. I developed, a, it took me a while, but I developed an interesting, uh, 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 I'm trying to think of the word I use, but an interesting script that I would use with whoever picked up the phone. And uh, I would call people and, and, and give them a pitch over the phone and make appointments and go out and talk to people. And uh, 
you know, I did that for a couple of years and, and uh, it, it was really great because I came to discover something that most people I find don't think that way. And that is that the, the, the telephone is my friend. I mean, I, I have no hesitancy to get on the phone and make cold calls to people. Why? Because I got, I got very good at turning nothing into something. A lot of people don't like to make phone calls because they don't handle the rejection. They have all kinds of stories about that. But, you know, I, when I would get on the phone, I'd say to myself, well, okay, I've got nothing. So if at the end of the day, I still have nothing. I haven't lost anything. But if I could turn nothing into something, boy, that's a good thing. So I got very good at making phone calls early on in the game. So that's how I started, um, which reminds me of another thing. You know, if you have a company, every company has salespeople. And if you were to ask me, you know, like right now, what business are you in? I'd say, well, I'm a business coach. But that's not what goes on in my mind. What goes on in my mind is I have this company, I need a salesperson, I'm the salesperson, so I'm in the business of selling coaching services. One of my earliest coaches told me to do that. Change my mindset from being a business coach to be in the business of selling coaching services. So when I get up in the morning, it's, okay, what am I gonna do today to sell coaching services? Now, I'm gonna get coaching services and I'm gonna have to do that, but you know, uh, a lot of times I'll be so busy coaching that it'll get in the way of me selling but I, I never forget the fact that I've got to go back and sell because if you stop selling, then eventually you run out of business. Um, when I went to law school, I was terribly insecure. I was like most people, I would never get up in front of a group of people. But I wanted to overcome that. And so I, I joined a Toastmasters club and went to meetings every single week. I did that for about two years. I became the president of my Toastmasters club. And it was really good that I did that. I did that during my lawyer days because it taught me to get over my fear of getting up in front of a group of people. And I noticed that I, I, I like doing that. So one of my rules is if it's not fun, don't do it. And so I said to myself, okay, how am I gonna get business and do it in a way that's fun? So my favorite way of doing it is speaking. You know, I get in front of groups and uh, give talks and I learned to give a talk like the one I, that, uh, I told you in the very beginning, it started with the story of the, of the anthropologist, but I would love to get up in front of a group of people and I would give them very intriguing um, ideas that would have them begin to see why their company wasn't working. So if you could give a talk like that story that I told at the beginning in which you distinguish you know, the ways of being as a human being that you can either play the game of win-win and you and me, or you can play the game of win-lose, you versus me. And if you can begin to see that one works and the other one doesn't, at least it have a successful company. And most people will begin to see themselves in that. And, you know, some people will think I'm crazy. Some people will be intrigued, but there will be people that will be very interested in what I have to say. And uh, it doesn't, become difficult to close business. Another way I closed business was by writing articles. Uh, so um, in the beginning, there was a period of time for about 10 years where I focused on law firms and I, I, that's all my clients were, were law firms. And I don't quite remember how I got all that business. But in 2000, I really wanted to take it up to the next level. And so I wanted to start speaking professionally. I joined the National Speakers Association. I hired coaches to show me how to position myself and recreate myself as a professional speaker. And um, I said, okay, well, who am I gonna give speeches to? So um, there is a, a book that Columbia Books puts out called the National Trade and Professional Association Directory. It's a directory of tens of thousands of trade groups for different industries. And if you don't know that, every single, just like the uh, ICF is the trade association for people in the coaching industry, every industry has a, has a trade association. And, and uh, I got a directory, you, they have a national directory, a regional directory, and a uh, local directory. Uh, 
and you could start at one end and work your way up, or you could start at the other end and work your way down. I chose to work with the national organization. I got the directory, I went through it, and I identified over a thousand associations that I thought would be interesting ones to pursue because there would be people in those organizations that could hire me, you know, like the ACEC, the American College of Engineering Companies. There's 50 chapters. These are all engineering companies and who belongs to the association, typically are the, are the managing partners. Uh, NECA, I spoke at NECA many times, the National uh, Electrical Contracts Association, uh, the International Sign Association, the American Bar Association, the American Legal, uh, American, uh, American uh, Legal Administrators Association. So I took all of these companies that looked like they were good trade associations, I put them in my database, which was an app database, I had over a thousand of them. And then I would get on the phone and start calling the association. I would ask, you know, do they have meetings and conventions? And if they do, you know, who arranges them and who arranges the speakers? And I'd get on the phone, I get the name, I get the name of that person. And I would start building relationship with them. And I would follow up and follow up in, in the early days. I'd have to put together a package of a one sheet and a video and all that kind of stuff. Now it's all on my website, so I don't have to, you know, do all that stuff and mailing stuff. But I mean, I would create relationship with meeting planners and find out what they were looking for, give them a pitch, find out what they needed, explain to them my difference. And slowly but surely, I started getting hired by these people to speak at their conventions. And, and it was wonderful. And, uh, and then I also found out that each of these trade associations have a magazine. So I'd get the name of the person who was in charge of the magazine. I would write an interesting article. One of my favorite articles was creating a winning atmosphere at work. And then I would talk to them and send them a copy of my article. And that particular article, creating a winning atmosphere at work, that probably appeared in 50 different trade associations because they all go to different people. So those are the things I like to do. I like to speak and I like to write. Um, and eventually, you know, when you, if you do, and I've gotten business from both of them. So for example, um, I gave a speech to a, a group called Cornet Global. These are people in the, in the real estate business. And that was in Washington, DC. And a man came over to me after my speech and he just started to chat with me. And he told me about his company. He had a real estate to come, real estate development company in Indianapolis and, and he had a, about nine people on his management team and, and all the different jobs that they did. And uh, I sat there and listened to him. And what made me say this, I don't know. But when you really listen to people, somehow ideas come into your head. So I said to him, I looked at him and I said, give me one word to describe the quality of the relationships between the people on your team. Because that's what I wanted to know. So he looked at me and he thought for a moment and he said, sucks. I mean, I, I, I cracked up, you know. I said, really, the relationships suck? He said, yeah, they hate each other, they don't work with each other, they stab each other in the back, it's horrible. Now, I don't know what you would have done, but I figured he just hired me. You know, I don't have to go try to sell him. So I said to him, so let me know. What do you want to do? Do you want to hear, sit here and talk about it? Or do you want to do something about it? He said, no, I'm talking to you because I want to do something about it. So I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. That's how easy it is sometime to close business. That, I'll tell you a story about that company a little bit later. Uh, I wrote an article in a magazine, a uh, magazine for the Association of Legal Administrators. One day I get a phone call. It was from a legal administrator with a law firm in Corpus Christi, Texas. And she said to me, um, I'm working for a firm. There are 15 partners, two firms that merged, very different cultures, and they don't get along with each other. So three years ago, we hired a, a consultant, took him away for a three-day retreat. It made no difference whatsoever. So two years later, a year later, we hired another consultant, took him away for a three-day retreat, made no difference whatsoever. 
So last year we hired another consultant, took him away for a three day retreat, made no difference whatsoever. I read your article and I think maybe you could help us. And I'm saying to myself, oh my God, I'm gonna walk into that hornet's list, but what the heck? I went down there, interviewed the partners. I took those partners, those same 15 partners, to the same hotel they'd been to now four years in a row and did my thing with them. And the morning of the third day, uh, I always give people a chance to say whatever they want to say to get the day started. Uh, and one man raised his hand, I remember Mike, he said, he said, my wife called me this morning to find out how it was going because she knows that we've been here for four years in a row. And what I told her was that I had experienced a miracle. And that if I didn't see this with my own eyes, I never could have possibly imagine that this would have taken place. And I sat there and I looked at the rest of them. I said, how many of you think it was a miracle? And they all raised their hand. Um, I have to tell you one other thing about that story. And that story was, that was the very first time I ever tried to do with a group of people what I did with them. And I had been through a, a workshop myself that made a difference in my life. And I decided to do that with this company. And when they left after three days, I remember walking out onto the beach in South Padre Island in Corpus Christi, Texas. And I just started to cry uncontrollably. I mean, I, 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 I had no idea that was gonna happen. But I just started to cry uncontrollably. When I get all done, I had an associate there and he saw me doing that and came over me. He said, what's going on with you? And I said to him, you know, um, I've spent most of my life trying to get things for me. But I have never experienced the level of joy and happiness and exhilaration that I just experienced from having the opportunity to do what I just did for those people. And I tell you, that was a turning point in my life because that was 28 years ago. Yeah, 28 years ago, I think. And I realized I had something extraordinary and precious that would make a difference. And I just continued to do the exact same thing. I do it a little bit better, a little bit better, tweak it here, tweak it there. But that's what really got me hooked into business coaching. The third example of why it's easy to, to get business is uh, I gave a talk in 2008 to the heat treating association. These are all people in the heat treating business. And there was a man from the labor department that came and gave this talk. He was a speaker before me. And uh, uh, so he gives this talk and he talks about how the economy just crashed and how you ought to plan on having cutting your income for about in cutting it in about half in the next year because it was really going to be miserable because of everything that was happening in the in the business. So he gets done, he walks out, I'm in front, I'm the up the speaker next. So I get up there, and the first thing I said was, Okay, how many of you are all excited about this next year, given the talk that you just had? And of course, people laughed. So I gave my speech as to why you don't have to listen to him, why you don't have to have your business cut in half, and why you could use some of the principles that I teach to be able to have a really successful year. Well, do you know three people after that speech? I didn't even have to go back. I didn't have to wait for the phone call. I had three presidents of three companies hire me on the spot just because I gave them some hope and enthusiasm. So uh, I've been closing business for a lot of years doing what I like to do, you know, speak and write. What I don't like to do is networking. I don't know why that is. When I get into a group of people, when I mean, get into a meeting with a group of people, I don't know, I'm just, it's a part of me that's shy, I don't like doing it. Well, at one point, I hired someone who was like the queen of networking. I mean, she was amazing. She worked with me for five years, so you don't have to do this yourself, and her job was to network. She got involved with every organization you can imagine. She would go, she'd come back with a fistful of cards. When I would have a speaking engagement, I would take her. She'd be working the room. And uh, boy, I tell you, she generated a lot of business for my company. So you don't even have to do it yourself. So anyway, so what does a coaching assignment look like? Well, 
in each of those cases, with every one of those companies and every one other than that, uh, I would do an all day of interviews to identify what's not working. So for example, the real estate development company or the company in Michigan, you know, I would go up there, spend a day, and I could interview, I would certainly interview all of the key people, but I would interview some other people in the company. I could interview about 15 people in a day, and, what, and I get paid my fee, so you know, my fee is uh, $6,000 a day, so I get paid my fee to go up there and spend the day interviewing people. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to find out what's not working, you know, why they're not a group of enthusiastic, optimistic, appreciative, and happy people work, you know. So usually there'd be no vision, they're not working together, there's lots of hidden agendas, you know, you can begin to see right away. It was like this boat in the middle of the ocean that was just flailing around. So uh, I would find that out. And it was interesting because I was getting paid to get the information I needed to sell them. And, you know, usually it wasn't the problem at all. So at the end of the day, after I've gotten all the information, I would meet with the management team, the powers that be, whoever was the, at the purse springs to hire me. And I would you know, report to them what I found, what the issues were, and I would basically, you know, the conclusion was you've got a great group of people, you've got a great company, lots of opportunity here, but, uh, you know, you don't have a group of enthusiastic people working together, it's not gonna be difficult to get that. So, um, uh, I, it, if I'm correct, in, in doing that for over 25 years, I can only think of three times where I didn't close the deal. Uh, one of them was with a, a meeting with 22 partners of a law firm and 21 of them wanted to go proceed, one of them didn't, and they let the one that didn't uh, stop them. Bizarre, bizarre. But my attitude is always, in that situation, I'm in front of the decision makers. I get one shot at closing the deal. If I don't close the deal, I'm not going to close it. If not, I'm going to kind of follow up with people. You know, people say, people say, I don't have the time. I don't have the money. I learned a long time ago. I don't have the time. I don't have the money is a lie. If anybody ever tells you, I don't have the time. I have the money. That's just what they're saying because they're embarrassed to tell you what the real reason is. So, and the real reason is always fear. Always fear. They're afraid that it could get worse, not better. So my job is to convince them it's not going to be difficult. Uh, I tell them stories, you know, I tell them stories about what I did with other companies and they finally get, well, if you did with them, you can do that with me. So my job is to overcome their fear and create a possibility for them that is too juicy for them not to step into. And the last thing I want to say about closing the deal is you never talk about money until the deal is closed. Never, never. Because I don't want to give them an excuse to say no. Because people get crazy when you talk to them about money. So I would say 80% of the time, I close the deal and we've never talked about money. Now the money will come up, you know, but I never talk about it until the deal is closed. I remember, I remember back in those early days when I was a franchisee, uh, I go to meetings, and in those days, I was closing business for like $15,000. And this one company got up and talked about what they do and how they write these proposals for six figures. And it was really, really interesting hearing what they did. Well, at the time, I was having a conversation with a senior vice president of Orange County for Colo Banker, and I was negotiating with him to do a training program to train 50 branch managers. And I really didn't know what I was going to do with them. But after hearing what these guys were doing with their clients, uh, I, I came back and I said, that would be really terrific with this guy. So I wrote up a proposal based upon what they told me to do. And I priced it at $87,500. I remember that very clearly. So I prepared this proposal. I, I called him up. I said, I finally figured out what I'm going to do with you. I went, I gave him the proposal and he read the whole thing and I could see him smiling. And then it gets to the very last page, and there is the price of $87,500. So I remember him looking up and looking at the paper, looking up, looking at me, and he said to me, that's a lot of money. Now, what did he just do? He just said something. He didn't ask me a question. He just said something. 
And I learned in studying sales is if someone asks you a question, give them an answer. If someone just says something, just acknowledge that they said it. So most people get in and just try to justify and explain why it was so much money. That's crazy. You shoot yourself in the foot. So he looked at me and he says, that's a lot of money. I looked at him for about 30 seconds. He looked at me. I looked at him. And at the end, I said, so do you want to do it or not? He says, yeah, I want to do it. I said, okay, sign there. And right in front of me, he signed it. Don't talk yourself out of business by trying to justify your fee. It, it doesn't work. So here's the best part of the story. When he gets all done, he said to me, there's nothing here about how you get paid. And I said, well, that's simple. Write me a check for $87,500. Now, remember, this is for a five-month training program. But I learned to have a lot of chutzpah. So uh, he looks at me and he says, really? I said, well, why not? He says, well, I don't know if I can do that. So I said, well, I don't know. Tell me what you can do. He says, call me this afternoon. So I call him later this afternoon. He says to me, uh, I talked to my uh, uh, controller. There's no way I could pay you that money in one shot. I said, okay, what can you do? He says, well, I can give you 30,000 this month. I'll give you 30,000 next month and I'll give you the balance the following month. I said, deal. When can I get the first payment? He says, well, come on over this afternoon. I'll give you the first check. Went over there this afternoon, got a check for $30,000 and next month I got another one. Now, anyway, so I got paid, you know, three months into a five month program we were paid in full. Here's the best part of the story. I didn't have a clue how I was going to deliver on that contract. I based the whole thing on this work that this company in New Jersey did, that I was part of their network. So I picked up the check for $30,000. I called their office and I said, there were two partners. And I said, is either one of them in? I don't remember their names now. And uh, I got one of them on the phone and I said to him, hi, this is Scott Hunter in California. I just sold your program to Coldwell Banker for $87,500 to train 50 of their managers. Here's the deal. I'll give you half the money if you come out and do the program for me and at the same time train me. He said, fine. So he just got some found money. I got paid half of $87,500 to get trained by them to do with their work. That's how I train myself as a coach. It's just, I've had so much fun doing some of these things I can't begin to tell you. So, I meet with these people, close the deal, and what do I do? Almost invariably, I take them away for a three-day retreat. I'll talk about what we do in the retreat in a moment, but I will take them away for three days. The management team, I've done it for as few as two people. I've done it for as many as 17 people. Most of the time, it's you know between eight, nine, 10 people like that. Take them away for a three-day retreat, turn them into a group of enthusiastic, confident, optimistic, appreciative, and happy people who have committed to work together on behalf of future they've all committed themselves to. And by the time I get done with them, you know, they're so excited that uh, they don't even know what to, to begin, uh, what to do. Uh, <laughs> this real estate company, when I got done, we did a three-day retreat in Prescott, Arizona. When I got done, with the three days with these nine people who hated each other and now they were in love with each other at the end of the retreat uh the owner of the company came over to me took out his checkbook and literally said to me how many blank checks do you want me to write and i looked at him and i said really he says yeah i just want you to know that you have carte blanche to do whatever you want to do with my company. I don't even want you to ask me. Just tell me what you're going to do. You have complete freedom to do whatever you want to do. I want you to take this work into my entire company. How many blank checks do you want me to write? I says, it's fine. You have to write. I mean, I should have taken some blank check. I said, yeah, I'll just send you bills at the end of the month and you can pay me. He says, fine. So you always, at the end of the retreat, see whatever is follow up, like with the company in Michigan and all these divisions. I worked with the management team. Six weeks later, I was back doing a follow-up day with the management team. I took all of their business units. I did a full-day program for all the people in all of their different business units. I worked with everybody in the company. And, uh, you know, like I said, one client is, I figured out early in the game that 
that one client is worth between fifty and a hundred thousand dollars. You don't have to have a lot of them to be able to make a substantial six feet through income. Okay, so what do we do in this three day retreat? Well, it's all based on the fact that when I start with them, they are unconsciously living in the world of win lose, right wrong, you versus me, the competitive world. They have no idea how to listen to each other. They have no idea how to work together. They have no, they are not aligned on a vision for the future. It's a mess. So that's where I start with them. And I want to end with them at the end. So we take them, you know, we just take them deeply into the world of win lose and uh, my ways of doing that, a lot of ways to do it. But nobody in their right mind wants to stay there. When you're seeing that you're living in this world of win-lose and right-wrong and competition and you're not talking to each other, nobody wants to stay there. So we ultimately reveal to them the world of win-win and have them begin to see that that's not only where they want to live, but that's what's going to have their company work really well. We teach them how to listen to each other powerfully so that they can communicate with each other. Uh, we have that, we, we teach them the function of language. Most people don't even know what the function of language is. People think, people use language to just talk. They don't realize that every word that comes out of your mouth is creative. There is no such thing as a neutral thought. Every thought creates, and people don't understand that, so we create that. So we teach them how to talk openly and straight to each other. And one of the things that really made the difference with that firm in Corpus Christi, which became the heart of the work, is that I've discovered that when people have relationships, both personally and in business, people have not learned three critical things. Number one, you gotta talk about everything. You have to talk about everything. Number two, you've gotta talk about everything in a, a kind and compassionate way. And number three, you have to make it safe for the people in your life to communicate to you. And because we haven't learned those lessons, you go into most companies, and there are all kinds of hidden agendas and people having all kinds of miscommunications and people having all kinds of disappointments and unfulfilled expectations. So at a certain point in this retreat, we will explain that to people and have them begin to see how much it's true. And I know it's true because I've interviewed all of them. So we will have a circle. We put one person at a time in the middle of the circle and we will have everybody in the room on the management team go around the room and communicate to this person in the circle everything they're not saying to them. But not in a, you jerk or you idiot, and I don't, no, no, not, nothing like that. You know, how we teach people to communicate is to say things like, so my expectations of you that are unfulfilled are, or I'm disappointed in our relationship in that. You know, my intentions for us that have been thwarted are, and what I'm not acknowledging you for it. So it's always very responsibly communicated. The person in the middle who's listening, you know, does not get to respond to anything. They just get to sit there and listen, and listen, and listen. The person over here gets to what I call empty their file, and the person in the middle begins to hear some of the things about their behavior, some of the ways that they operate, some of the things that they do, which offends people. You know, so it's very powerful uh, for the person speaking to get to say everything that they've been withholding. And it's very powerful for the person in the middle to be able to hear what people are not saying to them. So um, we do that process. We get one person at a time to sit in the middle. Everybody goes around the room. It's really extraordinary what happens when you get people to do that. When that's all done, when it's all done, we get the people, we go around the room and say, uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity to apologize. If anybody said anything to you that, you know, you want to take responsibility for and apologize, now would be an opportunity to do it. We distinguish the importance of an apology. And then everybody goes around and apologize. I've, I've sat in a room with people apologizing to each other for over an hour. You know, it's like they couldn't wait to be the next one to apologize. And then we get... After that all is done, I distinguish forgiveness, which most people don't want to forgive, but forgiveness is probably the most powerful force in the universe. And I have a whole talk that I do on the 
the power of forgiveness and not forgiving is like taking poison, waiting for the other person to die. And then we get people, and I always say something like, so look, we can't go back and do it all over again. You know, you did what you did without realizing the impact of what you did. So we can't go back and redo it. My question is, are you willing to wipe the slate clean? Are you willing to forgive each other and start anew? And every single time people are, are, can't wait to forgive. So they jump in and they forgive. And then I have this cute little thing that I say, I say, so listen, if I was a minister and this was a wedding ceremony, I'd now declare you husband and wife and you can kiss the bride. But I'm not a minister uh, and this is not a wedding ceremony, it's a different type of ceremony. But uh, I'm, so we're gonna take a break and I'm gonna trust that you'll know what to do to acknowledge each other. So we'll take a break. And I tell you, everybody just gets up and goes around the room and they hug each other, they shake hands, they cry. I mean, there's, a, there's an amazing catharsis that has taken place. And so when I, you know, I've gotten to the point now where I have built a team, you know, we've got rid of the baggage, they learned they really want to play the game of win-win they listen to each other they've learned how to do that they practice it it's really extraordinary um so we will also then talk about how you create a successful organization talk about the law of cause and effect which you probably know about and then we will create a vision most companies don't have a vision you look at the really successful companies like microsoft or or apple or google or any of them they all started with an extraordinary vision. And most people don't have a vision. So we'll work with the team on the third day, typically, to get them all aligned on a powerful, inspiring vision for the future. Uh, um, I, can, I can say a lot more about that. But again, the objective by the end of the day is to create a group of enthusiastic, confident, optimistic, appreciative, and happy people committed to working together on behalf of, of a future that they've all invented. And then of course, they're so excited, you know, it's like, you got carte blanche, we're gonna take this thing into the entire company and uh, share it with everybody. And uh, the work usually ends with a big launching event. We will get everybody in the company together for a big party and a big celebration. And we will share with, the, the management team will share with everybody the vision that they've come up with and get everybody aligned with that, and we will celebrate in advance the fulfillment of the vision. There's a little bit more detail to that on time for. But uh, when we get done, you know, you have this group of excited people all working together on behalf of this vision. So anyway, um, continue working with everybody, work with everybody in the company, get their commitment and, like I said, every client is usually, I, I've had clients that I've worked with for uh, a year or two, um, but you know, once you get started, it, 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 you know, it pretty much will run its course in, in less than a year. But um, again, if you're getting paid well, and I tell you something, up until about 2000, when I did these three day retreats, I did them by myself, but, uh, after 2000, I had met a number of women that I had met over the years that were very inspiring to me. And I, in one of the retreats I did, I invited one of them to come and do it with me. And I tell you something, there was some, it was, it was a order of magnitude more powerful to have a, a man and a woman in front of the room to do this work. And, uh, so after that, I never worked, I never did it on my own again. But we were charging at the time, uh, in, back in around 2000, $5,500 a day. And we would do a three day retreat and we'd have two people and I would charge full fee for both of them. So that was $11,000 a day. So to do one of these three day retreats would cost at least $33,000 plus some preparation time, plus travel time, plus an assistant in the back of the room. So we were talking about, and think about that in today's dollars, you know, in the early 2000s, these people were paying almost $40,000 for a three day retreat and they never batted an eye. Why? Because they began to realize right up front that they were hurting. And if, again, if you can produce the result, I've never, ever, ever had anybody say this costs too much, ever. 
So again, you have the opportunity to make a lot of money and make a lot of money doing extraordinary work with a group of people and really making a difference in their lives. So um, I don't know if there are uh, any questions. I, have, I may have time for one or two questions, but um, pretty much that's what I have time for. But before I ask Dave if there's any questions, what I do want to say is I so appreciate the opportunity to be able to share all this with you. Uh, and as I thought about this, I was left with in the final days of preparing for this that some of you may have your appetite whetted and may want some more. So I've already talked to the board at ICF about doing an all-day program because we just had an hour but i'd love to do an all-day program to walk you through in complete de detail what we do in the retreat my speech the whole ball of wax and uh i hope we can do that now um if we do it you can ask your questions there will be a, a fee we're not going to do it for free it'll be a couple of hundred dollars uh what the fee will be will depend upon how many of you are interested but if that's you from what I've been told you'll get an evaluation and there will be a question on the evaluation is if you'd be willing to interested in participating in an all-day retreat to go into everything we've talked about in much greater detail uh, so please indicate your interest if you are and if enough of you are interested to be able to make this you know viable we'll go from there in the meantime if you have any burning questions, you can email me. My email address is just scott at scotthunter.com. Or you could even call me at my phone number is 714-309-1099. I'd be happy to ask, answer any of your questions. Could you say um, the phone number again, please, Scott? I was, I was busy typing your email address into the chat when you said your phone number. Yeah, 714-309. 309 uh-huh 1099 oh, 1099 oh, that's in there now so we've got some reaction okay um, Wait, I we, wanted, uh, Dave, I wanted to say two yeah sure One sorry is, yeah I woke up this morning thinking about you know I might even be interested in doing some kind of a mentoring program where to some people that really wanted to get into this stuff if I had a group of people that wanted to get some mentoring on how to do this I I'm, I'd be open to considering that. You can, you can send me an email at scott at scotthunter.com. And I've been reluctant to do this because I literally have 10 copies of my book left. Literally. On the whole planet, that's the end of it. So if you'd be interested in getting a copy of my book, which explains everything we do, you can send me an email and uh, I'll see if I can get you one. So with that... I will turn it to you, Dave. Do you have some questions from people? I do indeed. I've got lots of reactions. So, um, Scott, you are you still have the magic. I've benefited from your classes in the past. A refresher or a mentoring program would be great. Thank you. That's from Karen. And thank you so much, Scott. You rock. I would love to incorporate this with my equine experiential learnership retreats. Uh, so someone I'm sure who will get in touch with you by email. Um, thank you so much. Fabulous. This man's information is priceless. So there we go. I wanted to check with you the name of the trade uh, publication that you said. Was that the National Trade and Professional Associations Directory? Did I get that right? Yeah, it's, 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 I haven't gotten a copy of it for many years, but uh, it's, the last time I looked, it was produced by Columbia Books. And it's called the National Trade and Professional Association. There's also a, a book called the Regional Trade and Professional Association. And there's another one called the State or Local uh, Trade and Professional Association. So I, you know, for example, one of the organizations I really loved was the American Council of Engineering Companies, ACEC. So I got a chance to speak at their national convention in Washington, D.C. I found out that they had 50 state chapters and I got the, the, I got the address and phone number. 
I think I did a, a program for, for at least half of those chapters. So I used my success with the national organization to get me to have opportunities in about half of the state chapters. And every one of those created business. I had a couple of clients in New Orleans. I had clients all over the country out of that one organization. So you could either go very deep into an organization or you can go wide and, and call all kinds of associations. There's so many of them. Cool. Uh, and then a, a question, question. Well, uh, there was another reaction. Can you give us the name of the queen of networking? Oh, she's not around anymore. Is she not? <laughs> and then, a, so a question, question, question. This is from someone called Aji or Aji or Aggie. Uh, some of the examples selling to leaders are male, male conversations. Do you think it makes a difference if you're a female selling to main leaders, male leaders? How might a woman adjust her approach to selling, if at all? Well, the interesting thing is, um, I told you that along the way, I met several women in various different ways. Either they were, I knew them through my men's and women's club, but they each had very successful businesses. And um, uh, one of them, Marlene, has a company, Momentum Consulting, in Texas. She's very, very successful. You know, I, I, I don't think a woman needs to um, modify their approach because I think the part of me that was successful in connecting with people and closing the business was much more the feminine part of me than the masculine part of me. So the masculine part of me was interested in running the business. But when I was connecting with people to be able to, well, I, that to, to connect with them, I think I really relied more on the feminine side of me to be able to do that. So no, I don't think yeah, it, you have to modify your approach at all. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Thanks for that answer. Uh, Anne Gal says, "Please count me in." With a with a heart emoji. So that's uh, someone who's interested in in the idea of uh, what you suggested of maybe you working with the chapter to provide some training for our members, which would be wonderful. Anyone else got any questions? Uh, Diana says, thank you, Scott. I'm interested in learning more about your one day session to learning more about how you conduct your three day retreats, Diane. So again, so someone else um, who's, who might be interested in what we can propose. Um, Kristin Strater says, I noticed on LinkedIn that Scott has invited people who've lost their job for a coaching session. How long do you talk? And is this pro bono? Um, how long was my talk for at these conventions? No, so I suppose you know. It's, no, so when when you do this uh, coaching for people who've lost their jobs, how long do you work with them for, and do you charge for that? Well, I don't work with people like that. People that oh, have right. lost their jobs. Yeah, it yeah, says I noticed on LinkedIn that Scott has invited people who've lost their job for a coaching session. Maybe it's someone's impersonal. Oh, I got it. Ah, right. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I put that on LinkedIn and, and I invite uh -huh. anyone who was frustrated about losing their job to call me, but I, uh, nobody has taken me up on that. <laughs> right. And I'm disappointed. I'm yeah. disappointed that they haven't. So. And would, would that anyway. be pro bono? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Okay. Wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah, it's always good to be able to give back at these times. Right. But I think on, on LinkedIn, there are so many people vying for our attention. That's the problem. Yeah, well, you know, I was never, I, I, I don't know. I just, to me, I said it earlier, for me, if it's not fun, I don't do it. Uh -huh. So I just did the thing. I just did the things that I had fun doing. I can't begin to tell you how much fun it is for me. But most people are crazy about it. But if you put a room up there with 250 people, I'm standing on the side waiting to be introduced. I'm like a racehorse in the, in the gate. You know, I can't wait to get out there. To be able to stand up and 
front of a group of people and say things to them that is going to short circuit their minds and have them think about things in a way that they haven't done before. To me, it's a thrilling experience. And, and then, uh, you know, I'll give out a handout, anybody who wants a follow-up session to coaching. And it, it, it's just a great way to generate business. And I've generated, you know, business for over 35 years just doing what I love to do. Magnificent. Well, I hope you found today fun. Have you enjoyed being with us today? I hope you found it to, fun to be with us today. Yeah, it really, it really was terrific. I got more excited, more excited as the time went on getting ready for today. And again, you know, if you're interested in doing a, a whole day thing, be sure to put it on your evaluation and that'll go to the board and we'll talk about doing that. If, it, if you want a copy of my book, you can email me. And if you want to find out more about my a mentoring program, you can email me too. And we'll see where we go from here. Fabulous. So just to be clear, what will happen is you will get all of the participants of today's webinar will get an email um, asking you how it was. And then we've added an extra question about would you be interested in doing this session with, with Scott? So let us know. Okay, we we done, Dave. We can uh, we can end there. Uh, Juliet was asking about whether you whether you can do your three day session online. Very topical question for these days when we're all at home safe. Could I could I do it online? Yeah. Well, um, you know we we have a group that gets together on Thursday night in ICF to talk about what we're doing and. My business was really, really successful every year except 2002 and 2003, because after September 11th, when people stopped traveling, it was a nightmare. So I just took two years off, used those two years to write my first book and to promote my book and stuff like that. Right now, if I was actively looking for business right now, I would be taken off a couple of months. Mm -hmm. I don't see how you could do what I do uh, virtually, you know, I have to stick people in a hotel room for three days, get them very intimate with each other. And, um, so I don't, I, 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 I'm not thinking about it because I don't want, I don't have to, but, um, I don't know how I could do what I do. I, I mean, like I said, mm -hmm. I get the business by speaking at conventions. Nobody's having conventions and I do the work by doing it in person with groups of people. So. So now is not a good time to try to figure out uh, how to do what I do. I just don't know how. Yeah, no, I think I'm with you on that one. I would find it difficult to imagine how you, as you say, because it's about, it's about relationship building. It's about getting people intensively to kind of work together on their issues over a period of time. And you can't, you can't say, right, we're going to be sitting in front of Zoom for the next three days. I don't think. Right. Well, wonderful. So, and thank you. Know, you. Carry on. I'm Scott. trusting that the, I'm trusting these circumstances are not going to last forever, and eventually people are going to be dying to get back to work and dying to work with each other. So, you know, that'll be a great opportunity to be prepared to mm -hmm. teach them how to come together in a more powerful way than they ever did before. Indeed. Excellent. Well, on that note, Scott, thank you so much. And we'll let you know what the response is to, to that idea. Again, so people can email you to, to ask for the, the last few copies of your book and any other questions they may have. So, and that, uh, your email address will go out in the questions uh, when the link to the recording comes out. So we look forward to hearing from everyone. And thanks once again, Scott, and I'll see you probably on Thursday, because as you mentioned, we've been having uh, weekly get togethers in this time just to offer support to each other as coaches to share ideas and just hang out. So I look forward to that. Great. Thank you again, Scott. Thank you to everyone who has been with us today. See you soon. Bye. Bye.